To be successful in the RIM 410 and 520 vegetation measurement and monitoring class, you need to have some basic skills in handling, analyzing, and visualizing your data. Now there are a number of different ways that we could do this, but one of the simplest and easiest to learn and use is Microsoft Excel. The same concepts though could be implemented in almost any spreadsheet application like Google Sheets, or you could do it in a statistics package like R or SAS. I'm a sucker for comics like Dilbert, and this one sums up pretty well what we need to address with Excel, data, format, and formulas. For the projects and assignments in this class, you'll need to be comfortable doing the following tasks in Excel. First is moving, manipulating, and formatting data to make it tidy. Second is creating formulas and formatting numbers. Third is calculating basic descriptive statistics like means, minimum, and maximum range and standard deviation. Third is finding t-values, then calculating confidence intervals and performing simple t-tests, and then lastly, making basic graphs with error bars. If you can do those things, if you're comfortable with that, you'll do really well in the class. Before we go any further, I wanna rant a little bit about tidy data. Tidy data is a term that we use in data science that refers to some basic principles of how we format data to make it easy to analyze. With tidy data, all of our observations are in rows, all of our variables are in columns, and our columns don't contain more than one type of information. An important aspect of tidy data is that it doesn't have a lot of extra spaces or unnecessary formatting. One of the things that really drives me nuts are these like heavily stylized, formatted, rendered Excel spreadsheets where it's more about how it looks and the style of it than about sort of where the data is and how to how to get to it. And those are just a lot of times really difficult to to analyze. It's difficult to find the data and structure it in a way that you can uh, easily do the analysis that you need to do. Now we often collect our data in untidy ways for convenience. So we'll lay out a data form that's more about being able to quickly and efficiently write the data down as we collect it, but then when we import it or input it into a computer, then we need to structure it in a way that is easy to analyze, not necessarily easy to enter. So here's an example of untidy data. Now there are a couple things going on that make these data untidy. First, there's extra rows in the header. Now this may seem like a good thing as it helps you visually separate out the different types of data, but it gets in the way of reading the data into uh, an analysis application like SAS or R. It can also make it difficult to find or grab the data that you need in Excel. It also has extra rows at the bottom of the data where the results of the analysis are stored. And this is actually a dangerous thing because you could accidentally get results in your analysis uh, where you, know, you really just need data. And so we should put these results either in separate columns or ideally we'd put them in separate tables. This data set is also missing a column header and there are line spaces between the post treatment data which are shown here and the pre-treatment data which are above it on the spreadsheet. So there's a bunch of things going on here that just kind of make these data visually kind of nice to look at but it from an analysis standpoint it's uh, it could be simplified to make it easier to grab the data that we need in the analysis. So this is an example of the same data that we've made tidier. You can see that we simplified the headers and we collapsed the data all into one table. This kind of format can be easily read into another program for analysis, or even in Excel, we can quickly reformat it with, say, with pivot tables, or we can quickly grab the data that we need for analysis. So we're gonna practice these Excel skills for class with uh, some data that were collected by the Bureau of Land Management for their Restore New Mexico project. Restore New Mexico is a collaborative project that was launched by the BLM in 2005 to restore the state's grasslands, woodlands, and riparian areas. And to date, more than 3 million acres of landscapes have been treated uh, in order to help restore them to a healthy ecological state. For this exercise, we're going to use some data that were collected by the Carlsbad Field Office of the BLM. Their goal was to apply herbicides to reduce shrub cover and increase the cover of native forbs and grasses 
that would in a manner that would be more consistent with the historic vegetation composition in that area. So we're gonna take a look at some data from the sort of pre-treatment era and then some post-treatment data and do some rough comparisons uh, between those. For the projects and assignments in this class, you'll need to be comfortable doing the following tasks in Excel. First is moving, manipulating, and formatting data to make it tidy. Second is creating formulas and formatting numbers. Third is calculating basic descriptive statistics like means, minimum, and maximum, range, and standard deviation. Third is finding t-values, then calculating confidence intervals and performing simple t-tests. And then lastly, making basic graphs with error bars. If you can do those things, if you're comfortable with that, you'll do really well in the class. Before we go any further, I want to rant a little bit about tidy data. Tidy data is a term that we use in data science that refers to some basic principles of how we format data to make it easy to analyze. With tidy data, all of our observations are in rows, all of our variables are in columns, and our columns don't contain more than one type of information. An important aspect of tidy data is that it doesn't have a lot of extra spaces or unnecessary formatting. One of the things that really drives me nuts are these like heavily stylized, formatted, rendered Excel spreadsheets where it's more about how it looks and the style of it than about sort of where the data is and how to, how to get to it. And those are just a lot of times really difficult to, to analyze. It's difficult to find the data and structure it in a way that you can uh, easily do the analysis that you need to do. Now we often collect our data in untidy ways for convenience. So we'll lay out a data form. That's more about being able to quickly and efficiently write the data down as we collect it. But then when we import it or input it into a computer, then we need to structure it in a way that is easy to analyze, not necessarily easy to enter. So here's an example of untidy data. Now there are a couple things going on that make these data untidy. First, there's extra rows in the header. Now this may seem like a good thing as it helps you visually separate out the different types of data, but it gets in the way of reading the data into uh, an analysis application like SAS or R. It can also make it difficult to find or grab the data that you need in Excel. It also has extra rows at the bottom of the data where the results of the analysis are stored. And this is actually a dangerous thing because you could accidentally get results in your analysis uh, where you, know, you really just need data. And so we should put these results either in separate columns or ideally we'd put them in separate tables. This data set is also missing a column header and there are line spaces between the post-treatment data which are shown here and the pre-treatment data which are above it on the spreadsheet. So there's a bunch of things going on here that just kind of make these data visually kind of nice to look at, but it, from an analysis standpoint, it's, uh, it could be simplified to make it easier to grab the data that we need in the analysis. So this is an example of the same data that we've made tidier. You can see that we simplified the headers and we collapsed the data all into one table. This kind of format can be easily read into another program for analysis, or even in Excel, we can quickly reformat it with say with pivot tables, or we can quickly grab the data that we need for analysis. So we're gonna practice these Excel skills for class with uh, some data that were collected by the Bureau of Land Management for their Restore New Mexico project. Restore New Mexico is a collaborative project that was launched by the BLM in 2005 to restore the state's grasslands, woodlands, and riparian areas. And to date, more than 3 million acres of landscapes have been treated uh, in order to help restore them to a healthy ecological state. For this exercise, we're gonna use some data that were collected by the Carlsbad Field Office of the BLM. Their goal was to apply herbicides to reduce shrub cover and increase the cover of native forbs and grasses that would, in a manner that would be more consistent with the historic vegetation composition in that area. So we're gonna take a look at some data from the sort of pre-treatment era and then some post-treatment data and do some rough comparisons uh, between those. Okay, so here's our game plan for this exercise. We're gonna take the Restore New Mexico data from Carlsbad and we'll start out by calculating some descriptive statistics like means and standard deviations before and after treatment. And then we'll move into calculating confidence intervals before around those means before and after treatment. 
and then we'll do some t-tests to look for differences in cover and finally we'll end up with creating some bar charts with error bars to to sort of visualize these data so at the end of all this this is what i want you to be comfortable with the very first thing is spreadsheet cell referencing so how do you point from one cell to another to get those data and, uh, and, and you know, use them in a more sophisticated way rather than just typing numbers in. And then we'll look at uh, a set of basic formulas. So there's your you know, simple math uh, operations and then average, standard deviation, counts, confidence, T, and a T-test. And then finally, the graphing functions for bar charts, legends, axes, titles, and, uh, and custom error bars, okay? So that's what we're gonna cover here in, in the next little bit. So let's flip over to Excel and we'll get started. Okay, so here's our tidied up Restore New Mexico data set. I've uh, loaded it up in Excel. This should look just like the example that we were looking at a couple slides back. And uh, what I'm gonna do here now is just create some places where we can store some results. And so uh, we'll do pre-treatment and we're going to look at uh, grass cover, fork cover, and shrub cover. And uh, let me get a little bit of space here so that flows better. Okay, so we're going to look at, calculate a, a mean, uh, a standard deviation, and we'll calculate um, a coefficient of variation I'm not going to go in too much to what that actually means right now, but I want to just sort of use it to illustrate some basic math functions in Excel. And uh, we'll do a confidence interval. And I'm going to grab those and paste them down here. And we'll do the same thing for post treatment, too. Okay. And then uh, eventually we're going to do a, a, a a t test now ideally i would actually put these results in another table entirely uh, or or just someplace else so that i don't mix up my uh, data themselves with my analysis results um, just for the, the point i made earlier about accidentally grabbing the wrong thing when you're doing uh, analysis or if you tried to read this into say r or another stats package having a bunch of other stuff over here on the side uh, can cause you problems so so in in practice it's a good idea to keep these things your data separate from your analysis and results for today for illustration purposes i'm just going to go ahead and combine all of these together here okay so uh first thing i want to do is uh grab a, or sort of calculate a, a mean for grass cover forb cover and shrub cover for pre-treatment Okay, so I'm gonna put my cursor here on this cell. And uh, if you've not used Excel before, there's sort of two different ways to, to enter values into a cell. You can either type something like a number uh, or, a, uh, or text in, into a cell, right? Uh, or you can do what's called a cell assignment and, uh, or a formula in a cell. And to do that, you, you first start with an equal sign. And the equal sign tells Excel that, hey, I'm going to actually calculate something or refer to uh, another cell in my spreadsheet. So we're going to use uh, a, a function here, a formula called average. And um, average does just what, what it says it's going to do. It's going to average a set of numbers together. And so I can type that average, and then I need an open parentheses and then you can see here it's it, it's wanting a number or it, what this actually means is it's wanting a series of numbers and so i can i could give it sort of individual cells separated by a comma or i can just come over here to the ones that i want with my cursor and i can click and drag down the full set of uh, of cells that i want and notice over here it's actually uh, specified this as the cell identity, right? So which is row or column and row. So column E row two is where it starts. And then there's a colon, which is telling Excel that this is a range of cells that I want to grab. And so it's gonna go from cell E2 all the way down to cell E11. 
and you can see those correspond to all of my pretreatment values for grass cover. Okay, now I close this off with a with a close parentheses, and then I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. And there you go, it's calculated my value for me. So 6.5 is the average grass cover for pre-treatment. Okay, I can do the same thing down here for post-treatment and grab those values. So E12 to E21, okay, and that gives me 24.4 as my post-treatment grass cover, okay. So let's go here, standard deviation is the same thing. That formula is uh, STDEV, and uh, we're gonna use this STDEV.S, and you're just gonna have to trust me on that for, for now, but that's the formula that you want here. I can either type it all out, or as I start typing it, start suggesting uh, formulas here that, that sort of you know fit what I'm typing. And uh, if I can sort of highlight the one that I want, and I can just hit the tab key, and it will go ahead and, and uh, fill the rest of that out for me. It's just a little shortcut. So standard deviation, and then I'm going to grab the same cells, E2 to E11. Okay, there's my standard deviation, 7.16. Let's do that for post-treatment. And there we go. All right, so there we go. If you need to edit uh, a cell, if you need to, uh, you know, fix something that's in there, like you know, like maybe you didn't get quite enough cells or you got the wrong ones, you can put your cursor or you know, sort of like highlight that cell and then hit F2. That will open it up for editing, rather than you know, just sort of like blanking it out and starting over again. And you notice when I do that that it highlights the cells over here that I actually grabbed. And that's kind of a nice little gut check for making sure that you got the right data. Um, so just hit the F2 button, open that up for editing, make sure you got the, the data that you intended. All right, coefficient of variation is really simple. It's just the, the standard deviation uh, that's standardized by the mean. And so I can uh, just do a simple math formula here. And so I'm gonna do the equal sign and I'm gonna just go up and, and grab my standard deviation value, which is K in cell K3, and then divided by, the uh, forward slash there is divided by, and then my other cell for the mean, which is in K2, and hit enter there, okay? And so that's just basic math, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, all, all works really pretty, pretty simply uh, in Excel using these cell references. Okay, we'll do the same thing down here. Standard deviation divided by the mean. Okay. Again, don't worry too much about what the coefficient of variation means. We'll go over that later in the class. I just wanted to use this to illustrate basic math functions in, in Excel between two different cells. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is calculate our confidence interval. And we're going to use a function called confidence t which is right there, okay? And, and you can see when I highlight it on it, it, it gives me a description, right? So it's gonna return the confidence interval for a population mean using a student's T distribution, okay? That, that's what I want. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit tab on that, and you can see it wants three things here. So it wants an alpha level. And so we're gonna do a 95% confidence level. So alpha, which is our type one error rate, is going to be 0.05. Okay, so that's our first argument, our alpha, and now I need to hit a comma, which is gonna take me to our next argument, which is our standard deviation. And we already calculated our standard deviation is right up here in cell K3. So I can either click on that cell or I can type K3 in there, either one, okay. And then it wants a size. Now this is a little confusing, right? Size basically means how many samples did you have? And uh, you know, well, we can look right here and say, oh, we, we had 10 of them for, uh, for, for pre-treatment. So I can either type 10 and uh, I'll go ahead and do that. And uh, there's our confidence interval, 5.12 and change, okay? The other thing I can do though, because like, 
if I had if I added some more samples to this data set, then all of a sudden my confidence interval would be wrong because I I baked in this number of, of 10, right? So then I'd have to go back and like edit this confidence interval thing and I need to remember to do that and and it's generally kind of like a bit dodgy to, to bake a bunch of numbers in like this when your data might change. And so one of the things that I can do here is actually embed another function inside my confidence interval function. And the function that we're going to use for that is called count. And so count is just going to do what it says. It's going to take a series of numbers and just count up how many of them there are. Okay. And uh, you can see then that I get the same number at the end, right? 5.12 and, and change. Okay. Uh, when you embed functions, you got to make sure that you uh, have all of the appropriate parentheses uh, that, you, that you need. And so in this case, let me highlight it here. Okay, there's our count function, which is just gonna count these guys up and return the number of 10. And I have to make sure that I have an open parentheses and a closed parentheses for that. And then, so that's just gonna do that and substitute that number 10 into the confidence interval function, which again has its own open parentheses and closed parentheses. So if you're trying to embed functions and you're, you're, you're getting uh, nasty grams from Excel because it's not happy about something, a lot of times it, it has to do with the parentheses. So, okay, so that's it, it's pretty simple. Let's go ahead and, and replicate that down here. Uh, alpha 0.05, standard deviations there, and we're going to grab our post-treatment data here. Okay, there you go. Confidence interval for post-treatment is about 10, okay? All right, so there's all of our values for grass cover. I guess we could go ahead and do the t-test here as well while we're, while we're at it. Um, and so that's a function called t.test, and it wants the actual like data values, right? And so our array one is going to be our pre-treatment data E2 to E11, and our array two is gonna be our post-treatment data, which is E12 to E21. And then it's gonna ask here for a couple of other things that it needs to know to do the t-test. Is it a one-tailed or two-tailed? Um, you know, we're just gonna choose two-tailed. Again, trust me on this. Uh, whoops. There we go, tails. Um, two-tailed and then type is going to be, uh, we'll just choose it uh, two sample with unequal variance. Close that off. And there's our t-test values, okay? Um, this is a p-value, I guess we could say that here. Okay, and again, I'm not gonna go into like what the p-values actually mean. Um, Suffice it to say that this is, uh, you know, fairly convincing evidence that there is a difference in grass cover between the pretreatment and post-treatment. But uh, we'll we'll cover the interpretation of these tests and their values in uh, in a different part of the course. All right, so there's all of our data that we needed to calculate for uh, for pretreatment, post-treatment. Okay. Now, one of the great things about having tidy data is that it makes it really simple to replicate these calculations to our other uh, variables that we have. So here's grass cover. I can highlight all of these values here and then see this sort of uh, green box down in the corner. I can click and grab that and just drag it over here to forb cover and shrub cover. And it just like auto magically populates those boxes. Um, so if I look in here, so in, now instead of the average of E2 to E11, for forb cover, it's just moved it over and it's doing the average from F2 to F11, okay? So it's a really nice shortcut for, uh, uh, for replicating these calculations. If I take the time and, and sort of set them up right, and I take the time and I structure my data correctly too. I can do the same thing for my t-test. I can grab these guys and uh, drag them over here and uh, just sort of replicates my t-test around as well. Okay, so that's it for the first part where we calculated the statistics and uh, did the sort of t-tests. 
looked at cell referencing. In the next part, then we'll cover how to do the graphs and put the error bars on them. All right, now that we have all of our statistics calculated for our indicators, we're going to go ahead and make a graph to visualize the results. So the first thing I want to do is highlight the values that I want to graph. And so we're going to graph the means for grass cover, forb cover, and shrub cover, both pre-treatment. And now I'm going to hold down the control key, which is going to allow me to select some other cells that are like not attached, not contiguous to the other cells that I've selected. And so these are all the data that I want to graph. Now up here at the top, I'm going to go to insert. And over here on the chart types, I'm going to pick a uh, 2D column chart. And uh, there you go. That's pretty much the data that we want. We need to spend a little bit of time making that look good. I'm going to slide over here. We're, we're done with the actual data themselves. We'll just be working with the statistics now. All right, so in my chart here, um, first thing I want to do, we're going to, we'll just sort of move things around a little bit. Um, important note here, when you do a chart for class, I expect to see all of the chart elements on it. So it, obviously you have the data. Uh, it's not a chart if you don't have the data on there. And then I want to see uh, legends. I want to see axis titles and I want to see a chart title overall and uh, will always want error bars unless I tell you otherwise, okay? So, so those are all the chart elements that, that we want to have. Um, I'm just gonna kind of play around with this a little bit. Uh, I like to put the legend up here so that it's uh, out of the way of my, of my chart axis labels so that there's no confusion there and then uh, we will go ahead and, and if you click on this plus thing here this opens up a little box where you can add things to your chart and I'm gonna add my axis titles so we gotta move that over a little bit so you can see my axis titles here okay and uh, uh, so and you can edit those just by clicking on them and so we will call this um, say like um, We'll just call it indicator for now. That's good enough for what we want to do. And over here, this axis title is uh, percent, did I spell that right? Yeah, percent cover. All right. And then my, uh, my overall chart title is, oh shoot. There we go. My overall chart title is going to be, uh, average cover by functional group, okay? Plant functional group. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Uh, two things I need to do still. One is, uh, it, it's just saying series one and series two, and so I need to kind of change those to be pre-treatment and post-treatment, and then I need to add the error bars here. So to change these, there's a couple ways to do it. The, the best way to do it so that if you change your, your data, if you change the values here, it'll automatically reflect in your chart, is to right click on your chart and go to select data. That's gonna give you this box. And notice it, it highlighted the data here uh, that's, that's in the chart. And uh, so I have series one and I can click on this button to edit that. And you can see the series name box is empty. Okay, now I could either, I could type something in there, I could type pre-treatment, but then again, that just bakes that value into the chart. And if I changed the name, I wanted to call it something else, then uh, I'd have to go back in and manually change it. The other thing I can do is give it an actual cell reference. And so I can click on the, the button there and then I can come up and select the cell. You can see it says sheet one exclamation mark and then this dollar sign j dollar sign one okay and that now calls it pre-treatment i can do the same thing for my series two we're going to uh, grab that cell so now it says post treatment on those okay now if i change these values here they would automatically reflect in the in the chart all right and i can i can play around with with, with sort of the placement of all of this and making it look uh, pretty good, okay? So 
we're getting close. The last thing we need to do are the error bars. Now, error bars in Excel charts are a little bit weird. Uh, we can come to the plus and we can uh, choose to add error bars and you can see what it what it's doing just by default is adding these these sort of wide error bars that are the same for each indicator in the series and that's just like that doesn't make any sense right why would the grass cover error bar be so large compared to the amount of grass cover that we have versus the shrub cover error bar right and so we need to customize these error bars right so we're going to uh we'll do the the sort of pre-treatment first I'm going to click on this uh, triangle here, which is going to give me some options, and I'm going to choose more options. And it's going to say, okay, which one do you want? We'll do pre-treatment. All right. Now, we want both directions here, uh, which means it goes above and below the line. And for our error amount, right, we want to choose custom. And then we'll click the button to specify a value and it's going to say, okay, what is your positive value? And for our positive value, we're going to grab all three cells for the confidence interval. Okay, and same thing for our negative value. So positive value means it goes above the, the sort of bar and negative value means it's going to go below the bar. And I'm going to, again, grab all three values for my confidence interval for pretreatment. And then I'm going to hit OK. Now, notice what it did here. So it's added these confidence interval bars above and below the line, and they're, they're symmetric, right? That's what we want. But you can see that they reflect the actual confidence interval around that, that average that we calculated, around that mean. And so our FORB value confidence interval is much smaller because the confidence interval is smaller, okay? So this is a, a good gut check when you're doing your graphs, make sure your error bars are actually reflecting the, the values that you, that you want. If you have error bars that look exactly the same for everything, that's usually an indicator that, that something's not right. All right, so let's go ahead and add the error bars for post-treatment. We're gonna do that exactly the same way. Uh, custom, specify the value. And for um, positive, I'm gonna grab my confidence interval values. And for negative, I'm gonna grab the same thing. And hit okay. All right, so that's it. That's our graph right there. So that's it for our Excel crash course. If you're comfortable with what we've done here with the calculations and with the graphing, then you shouldn't uh, have too much trouble with the assignments in the REM 410 and 520 class. If any of this stuff is new or you're just not feeling confident with it, I'd really recommend you spend some time online looking for some Excel tutorials. There's, there's tons of stuff out there and uh, just gain some experience, get, get some practice with these things and you should be well set up for the assignments in the class. And uh, last thing, if you have specific questions about how things are calculated or what I'm looking for for an assignment, make sure and uh, drop me an email and let me know. Thanks. Mm -hmm.